Chapter 6, Informant 1301 dives in. As planned during his introduction to 20th Street at the immigration hold, Diego met Cypher a few days later at the corner of 19th and Valencia Streets, and the two of them walked to the Mission Playground together. Cypher told Diego he had only recently been jumped in by 20th Street and that he was still sore from the beating. He also said he planned on getting a large Marasava Trusha tattoo on his back. Diego understood that Cypher, being a rookie Marrero, was especially dangerous to him because he still had something to prove to the gang. Killing a rat like Diego, if he was ferreted out, would be a big feather in a new member's cap. Walking toward Mission Playground, Cypher bragged on and on about pegados, or hits, on rival gang members who MS-13 members called chavalas or chapetes, as well as hits on suspected rats inside 20th Street. On the way to the park, the two were joined by another 20th Street member named Vaselina. He was a slender 20-year-old with long, greased back hair. As the three walked along, they discussed the possibility that there was a rata named Dreamer currently in the clique. Dreamer was now in the gang's crosshairs for talking to SFPD cops about other gang members and senior members of 20th Street had ordered him to get his forearms tattooed with MS to confirm his allegiance to the gang. At Mission Playground, the three homies watched two local soccer teams compete. The gangsters bullshitted and felt one another out for a while before parting ways for the night. The next day, Diego met Cypher and Comillo, whose bedroom Santini had stood in during Operation Mission Impossible. A more seasoned 20th Street gangster with a shaved head and a gold earring that read MS. Comillo wore baggy blue pants and Nike brand Cortez sneakers. He was older than Diego, who sensed that his interactions with Comillo were an important test. Comillo was obviously street hard and Diego was certain that Cypher had purposely set up this meeting so Comillo could check him out. While eating tacos at the Casa Sanchez Taqueria, Comillo bragged that some 20 street clique members had committed four killings in just that month alone. He also indicated that all the homicides involved the use of a community gun, a 45 caliber pistol that Comillo kept in his possession. When they finished eating, the three homies walked to Mission Playground. Diego sensed another important test for him was about to occur. Numerous Marreros from 20th Street Click were present. He took a deep breath and strolled into the park alongside Cypher and Comillo. There he met some other 20th Street members for the first time, including Dreamer, the suspected rat, and Tigre, the gang leader. Tigre didn't wear gang colors or look like a gangster at first glance. He looked like a typical blue collar Latino man. What Diego noticed about him was that he was obviously hardened from the barrio, but also had a smooth confidence. Tigre wasn't trying to act tough like most of the younger gangsters did. He just was, and he was taking a liking to Diego as the group discussed numerous gang-related issues, most importantly, the current lack of organization within 20th Street. The clica needs more direction, Tigre told Diego. I am glad you were here. You know how things should run. You could help with the new homies who need to learn La Mara's Reglos the right way. See, si, Diego said, I can help. I am familiar with the rules of La Mara. 34 years old, married, and the father of two young daughters, Tigre was one of the founding members of 20th Street in the mid-1990s, along with his friend Memo. 5'9", 170 pounds, and a square head, broad shoulders, with short cropped black beard, he was regularly employed as a union carpenter. He had emigrated from El Salvador as a teenager and was now living in the country legally. Despite the city's sanctuary policy, which officially forbade SFPD from working with HSI, with the help of Gibson, Santini assessed the SFPD's criminal records on Tigre and learned he had a history of serious violence. Tigre may look unassuming, but he has had his hands in a lot of dirt over the years. Gibson relayed during a recent meeting with Santini. He's been loyal to the gang from the start, and although he stays out of the mainstream, not hanging out with the homies in the park, he is in it for the long haul. Tigre doesn't have to commit crime anymore. He just orders it. One evening, four years earlier, during the start of a Christmas season, a 15-year-old girl hurried down the stairs to greet her mother in the garage of their modest single-family home in the Ingleside Heights neighborhood. She was on her way to help her mother with a bunch of bags from a long day of holiday shopping. 
The excited teenager paused for a moment in the front hallway, admiring a big wreath her father had just hung on the front door. Making her way to the garage, she heard her mother's voice, full of distress. Please, someone help me, her mother called. I'm coming, Mom, the girl replied, imagining her mother was struggling with an armful of shopping bags. The girl pushed open the door to the garage and saw two men, Tigre and another MS-13 gangster named Oscar Gonzalez, a.k.a. Nino Manioso, wearing black ski mask and dark clothing holding guns. Call the police, her mother yelled. Don't move, Tigre shouted, causing the girl to scream in fear. At that, Tigre smashed the mother in the face and head repeatedly with his pistol. The terrified girl saw blood pour from her mother's nose. She ran screaming through the first floor of the house, back toward the staircase leading to the second floor, with the second gunman chasing close behind. In the garage, the mother was half conscious from the vicious pistol whooping as Tigre screamed at her in thick Spanish accent, give me the money. The stunned woman fumbled through her purse, handing him a bundle of $725 in cash. He counted it quickly, then shouted, Fuck! All of the money, lady! I know there's more of this. We've been following you for a long time. Tigre grabbed her and pulled her inside the house. He yanked three rings off her fingers. One with a diamond and two with sapphires. We are Arabian, he offered lamely. We are part of a terrorist group. Meanwhile, the terrified daughter had stopped running halfway up the stairs to the second floor where she met her father and a male cousin who had heard her screams and came running to her aid. Nino Manioso confronted all three family members on the staircase and ordered the two males to come down to the living room and lie face down on the floor while the girl sat at the kitchen table shaking in terror. Where is the money? I know you collected it, Tigre screamed at the father. The thug was after rent from the family's Excelsior District investment property, which the sole tenants paid every month in cash. I, know, I don't know what you're talking about, the man pleaded. Manioso positioned the crying and bloody mother next to her husband on the floor. We've been following you for two months, Tigre demanded. Give us the fucking rent money now. I didn't collect the rent. I swear, I came straight home, the father said. The gunmen were incensed now and screaming at the man, pointing their guns. Tigre took his watch and wallet and began scavenging the room for valuables while Manioso covered the family with his gun. Upstairs, unnoticed by the thugs, a teenage male member of the family had heard the screaming and quietly slipped into a bathroom with a phone. He dialed 911. While on the phone with the police dispatcher, he heard a knock on the bathroom door. Is anybody in there? Manioso called. The frightened teenager laid the phone on the floor, still connected with the dispatcher. I called the police, he shouted through the door. Manioso attempted unsuccessfully to force it open. They called the cops, he yelled downstairs to Tigre, let's get the fuck out of here. Tigre and Manioso ran together from the home through the garage door where they were met by a police car that had raced to the scene. Caught in the headlights, they both raised their hands as the cops approached them with firearms raised. The police screamed at the two thugs to get down on the ground. Instead, they ran back into the garage smashed out a window and jumped over a backyard fence. Both the Ingleside and Terraval police stations called out to responding units that the suspects were running southbound on the train tracks toward the Daly City BART station. A unit responded on the radio just moments later that a possible suspect was in custody at the Rite Aid Pharmacy on Alamany Boulevard. Manioso was arrested in possession of $2,700 in cash and a Rolex watch from the home invasion. Tigre, on the other hand, had escaped. Several months later, at around 2 o'clock in the morning, at 22nd and Bryant Street in the Mission District, a Norteño member named Dexter and four of his friends were sitting on the front steps of his home, drinking beer and chatting about hip-hop music. The group had heard car tires screeching toward them on Florida Street and saw a small red Honda Civic stop abruptly in front of the house. From the passenger side of the car, Tigre leaned out of the passenger window. Fuck Norte, he shouted, before firing a gun several times at them, then speeding away. As the group of Norteños began to register what had just occurred, they realized Dexter was moaning in pain and holding the side of his face. He had been shot in his right cheek and couldn't speak. Dexter's friend, Brandy, took off her sweatshirt and pressed it against his wound to stem the bleeding, while a male in the group called for an ambulance. Two SFPD officers arrived moments later, as did paramedics who attended to Dexter's wounds. 
They discovered a bullet lodged in his cheek, which would require surgery to remove. Brandy told the cops she recognized the shooter, Tigre, because she had previously dated his younger brother. She also told the cops Tigre was an MS-13 gang member. The cops were notified by radio that the red Honda had been located, abandoned just six blocks away on the 400 block of Shotwell Street. It was double parked with the engine running and the ignition punched, a common technique used by car thieves. A subsequent investigation by the SFPD gang task force revealed that besides Tigre, the passengers in the Honda included the gang leader Memo and two females named Mafalda and Gorda. Photo spreads were given to all the witnesses at the scene of the crime, including Dexter. Three of the witnesses identified Tigre as the shooter. SFPD visited Tigre's residence that same morning and arrested him without incident. He was wearing a baseball cap with a patch on it that read San Francisco Conservation Corps, a jobs program for at-risk youth funded by private and public funds, including the city's Office of Economic and Workforce Development, as well as the Juvenile Probation Department, Log Cabin Ranch. The cap also had MS written in block letters on the bill, as well as Tigre's name. The police seized a 38 caliber handgun, 25 caliber ammunition, as well as a safe they opened after the boyfriend of Tigre's mother agreed to provide the lock combination. Inside, detectives discovered more ammunition, including 38 special, 38 short, 25, and 22 caliber. It also contained a diamond ring with two sapphire rings. Neither the Excelsior family home invasion nor the attack where an eyewitness identified Tigre as the shooter was ever prosecuted by the city's district attorney. As Santini was discovering, Tigre's ability to escape punishment was consistent with a common pattern in San Francisco of gang members getting away with serious violent crimes. Even after the mayhem and terror Tigre had instigated, he had remained free to the, 